Well, I mean, first of all, if you the the the, the mechanism, the transmission mechanisms, or how should we say, the way crisis was going to enter China, uh, it was quite different from the way it was entering, say, Eastern Europe or or, or Europe and the U.S. In the sense that it wasn't necessarily a financial uh, um, effect, but it was happening through the trade account. So the question is, is how was China able to manage its trade account? And it, the problem, China did suffer seriously for a short period of time. A lot of factory closures and, and all along the coast, basically. Um, but I think, uh, so they have responded very immediately, uh, immediately uh, quicker, I think, than everyone else uh, with this massive stimulus package. Now, obviously, a lot of people argue that the stimulus package, a lot of what was in the stimulus package was already promised in the previous budget. Uh, like the earthquake relief, for instance, accounted for a significant proportion of the stimulus package. But I think what's, what's particular about it is, regardless of that, uh, it's the fact that they were able to do that. And I think the reason they were able to do that was um, uh, a very, I think, a strong and effective state that's able to uh, basically allocate, uh, allocate the revenue uh, very quickly and rapidly towards different needs. They can also go into budgets, uh, a de sort of deficit spending, and they can also um, um, they also control the financial sector, which is a big, big portion of it, I think, as well. Because they immediately had monetary loosening, which basically meant they allowed the banks to to, to expand lending in the economy, uh, and so lending increased dramatically over a very short period of time. Uh, and they can do that because uh, the banking sector is basically state owned. Uh, it's uh, the banking sector has since 2003 uh, somewhat liberalized, uh, but in the Chinese context, liberalization has to be qualified because the entry of foreign banks has been very, very limited. A few, only a few percent, uh, to maybe two to four percent of the banking sector uh, has any foreign involvement in it, uh, and some of the banks are privatized. But generally, what's happened is the large, sort of the big four Chinese banks, uh, instead of being privatized it's more being decentralized. So what you have is the decentralization of banking, but it's still state owned. So it's provincial level governments that own the banks or uh, towns and counties and cities that own the banks, but it's still effectively a state owned, nationally owned banking system. Uh, and, it's, and banking allocation also isn't necessarily determined by interest rates. It's much more directed credit. So you have a, situ a government that, I mean, as much as Wall Street and, and, and uh, High Street in London would criticize this model because it's not an Anglo-American model, uh, it's very, very effective for uh, doing fiscal or a monetary stimulus. So, I mean, essentially, this what's underlying the story is this is 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 um, through national and state ownership of key sectors in the economy. Mo one of the most key being the financial sector, they are able to respond extremely quickly. Uh, now, whether that there's a lot of criticisms of their response uh, in terms of the medium and long-term effects of it. Uh, because a lot of most of the focus of the response was on investment rather than on consumption, uh, but nonetheless, that's I think the you know the the aspects of resilience are really rooted on these factors. Uh, repressed consumption gives us the impression that basically people are not having any improvement in their consumption at all which isn't the case. You, on average, you see very rapid increases in consumption in China. It's just what's happening is that the consumption is not incre is increasing as fast as the overall GDP, and it's not increasing as fast as investment. So as a result, consumption as a share of GDP is falling. But in terms of the actual amount of money people are spending each year, that's increasing quite rapidly. 7 to 8% a year. I think it would make any developing country envious and <laughs> you know I think if, if Indian uh, res if Indians would be having seeing their consumption rising seven percent a year I think they'd be quite happy with that regardless of whether the share of consumption in GDP is falling uh, I think so this falling share of consumption is just uh, an indication of the fact that the the growth model is very mu very strongly investment led uh, uh, and the government has been aware of the fact that it's investment led uh, but, and they've been trying to correct that since the 1990s, uh, particularly since the East Asian crisis in 97, 98. Uh, there was a lot of senior economists in China who were advising that the government ha had to start to correct this tendency. Uh, because in that time, in the face of the East Asian crisis, 
the government again had a big stimulus and the major focus of the stimulus was an investment uh, and there was a lot of overcapacity and they were worried about basically falling into a lull. Uh, so since that time there's been major awareness of this problem uh, and they've been trying to address it in a variety of different ways through anti-poverty programs, through uh, cheap state um, um, sort of um, uh, state bank uh, lending in the rural areas for instance. They have been implementing a whole bunch of uh, measures like that um, but the reality is what's been driving the model has been the investment. The investment growing sometimes at 25-30% a year uh, at a phenomenal pace. And obviously, so what do you do in that situation? Do you say, no, 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 we don't want to grow that fast? Or do you say, ride the wave and, and try and manage the results? We have to differentiate different types of inequality in China because uh, a lot of people talk about regional inequality in China, the coastal regions taking off uh, um, ahead of the interior and the western regions. And actually I've done a lot of my research in western China and uh, that type of inequality has actually improved. Uh, the government in the late 90s started a massive stimulus program which was called, uh, well, in Chinese it was called the Shibu Dai Kaifa, uh, which basically means uh, the Open the West campaign, uh, if it's properly translated. But it's being called in the English literature as the Western Development Strategy. Uh, it's basically a huge amount of funding that the government started directing towards the Western regions. And that had actually been planned in the ninth five-year plan in, in, in the mid-80s. Uh, basically, China chose this um, unbalanced growth strategy of first concentrating on the coastal regions, and then concentrating on the interior regions, and then in 96 onwards, concentrating on the western region. So from 96 onwards, and particularly from 2000, you see this huge increase in state subsidized uh, uh, spending and investment uh, in the western regions, and provinces like Sichuan, Gansu, Qinghai, uh, Tibet Autonomous Region are growing at a faster rate than the national average, and it's real growth, it's not just fictitious growth. You know, the, Accuracy can be doubted sometimes, but generally speaking, if you have been there, you can see the speed of the growth right in front of you, and there's no question about that. Uh, so through those strategies, they, they managed to correct a lot of the regional inequality. Uh, what I argue, at least in the western region, because uh, I think in the eastern region it might be a different story, but in the western region, what's happened is that the western regions on average are catching up. But what's happening is within the Western region, inequality is rising between households. So you're seeing rising rural inequality, rising urban inequality, and rising rural urban inequality within all of these regions. Uh, and I think that's, the government is very aware of it. Uh, a lot of its anti-poverty policies are targeted, aimed at addressing it. But as we know from the debates on poverty policy, usually poverty targeting is not very effective. Where they had the greatest amount of poverty reduction in China was in the early 80s. Uh, and it came about largely through decollectivization and the individual household responsibility system. A lot of people know about that story, but the other part of the story that people don't talk about is also they had an increase in the terms of trade of agricultural goods vis-a-vis -vis industrial goods. So that means the price, the average price of agricultural goods that farmers sell vis-a-vis -vis the average price of the industrial goods, the manufactured goods that the farmers buy, yes. increased by about 40%. So basically they rose the, per, the, the prices of, that determine the incomes of the farmers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the prices of what they consume, about 40%. So it was a direct price manipulation that the, the, that the Communist Party was able to do because they controlled prices at the time. So that combined with the individual household responsibility is what produced the largest and fastest poverty reduction in the world uh, at that time. And it's since then poverty reduction in China has been quite stagnant.